Hi, welcome to the Mattermost Dev Talk on the Web App Developer Workflow. I'm Harrison from Mattermost Core Team. So this talk is going to be centered around how to set up and run the web app to make whatever changes you'd like to it. Um, first off, we're going to be talking a bit about setting up the development environment, then kind of how to run and test the Mattermost web app to make sure it's working properly. Um, give a brief walkthrough of the project structure and where you can find everything, and then kind of some just high-level summaries of how to do some common tasks like changing React components or uh, making changes that'll involve Redux because that's a bit more complicated. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So first off, set up your development environment. You can use really whatever text editor you want. We don't really have a standard. I know I use Sublime myself. Some people use Vim or WebStorm or all sorts of different things. You probably even use Notepad if you're wanting to make this really difficult. Um, I would also recommend installing, there will be a lot of plugins you can use, particularly for because we use JSX, not just plain JavaScript. You want something like the Babel plugin that I use. Or, and also, the, different ones like the editor config plugin, I find this really helpful because it'll get all your spaces and tabs fixed, so you don't have to deal with that. Um, and once that's set up, you'll be installing Go and Docker. They're required to run the server right now. You need to also run the server to be able to run the web app kind of in a test environment. Um, you'll install Node.js and Yarn to actually run and get all the dependencies for the web app. Um, and then you'll be forking and cloning the repositories, in this case the server and web app. That'll allow you to make your changes and then if you're wanting to submit PRs back to it or back to us, um, you need a fork to do that. Um, th that's kind of a quick summary of it. You, if you go to our developer documentation, you can find a much more detailed version where it'll give you all the exact commands to run and we have different configurations that work on Windows, Mac, different flavors of Linux, so that's probably a good place to go check out. Um, then once you've got it all installed and running, you, we use make files just for kind of convenience because we do a bit more than just a basic, uh, you can just run with yarn. Um, particularly if you're wanting to run the server and client, you can either run them kind of in separate windows, uh, as the first example shows, or you can run them together just in front of the server directory. This, it tends to be a bit easier to run them separately just because sometimes if one has an error, the other, the output from the other one will just stomp all over that and it makes it hard to actually find the error. Um, you can run unit tests using make test, again, either from the web app or server directories. You probably don't care about the server tests at this point, so just probably the web app ones. Um, you can run ESLint to check the styles, which I recommend doing if you're gonna submit a pull request to us because the uh, Jenkins server will automatically fail any builds that have style errors. Uh, you can build a release build of Mattermost using make package. If you're building from the server one, it'll generate the binaries and everything for kind of all three major platforms. If you're running from the web app one, it'll just generate you the uh, a kind of zipped up compiled version of the web app that you can deploy over an existing Mattermost server client if you want. Um, most importantly, there's make help. It'll list all these commands and kind of a few more if you're wanting to poke into the internals a bit more and do anything kind of less common. So if you got the web app now, uh, there's a lot of different folders in it. Um, if you take a look at the right there, you can see all of them. A lot of them probably aren't important for you. Um, most important ones and kind of some extra ones are kind of listed on the left. Uh, the actions, reducers, and selectors are all Redux related. If you're not familiar with Redux, I'll speak a bit about that and give some more helpful links for it later on. Uh, the components folder is all the components that actually render the app. Um, yeah, if you're not familiar with React, I will speak a bit about that a bit later on um, as well. There's the internationalization folder has a localized text. If you're submitting a pull request to us, uh, we prefer if you just make changes to the English strings. Um, and the all the other translated ones we've done through our translation server. Just kind of keeps the process working a bit easier if you only change the English ones here. Um, you've got the SAS folder, has all the SAS styling information for components um, if you're brave and wanting to do CSS stuff. Uh, there's the store, or stores just has kind of the previous Flux data stores. If you're, again, it, yeah, that's been kind of replaced with the Redux code, so you're probably not going to have to touch those at all. Um, the tests, or tests. And then there's the utils folder, which has all the bunch of utility functions, constants, a bunch of things like our emoji code and user agent detection are also in there if you're working with those. All right, so common tasks. Uh, first off, we got writing React components. So React is 
that is the library for defining our user interfaces as written by Facebook and frankly I think it's a great library. Um, as you can see kind of in the bottom right there's a bit of an example of a component. They all extend either a React component or React Peer component. Um, got some internal state. There would normally be kind of some prop types defining what gets passed into the component. Um, and the basic gist of how a React component works is that it renders the state and props. You shouldn't be rendering any external stuff pulling in data from elsewhere. And this kind of gives a lot of nice behaviors in that it's very efficient in that it should only re-render when one of those changes and it won't re-render just when it doesn't need to. Um, it does all this using some fancy technology that kind of keeps it really efficient when it gets translated into HTML later on. Um, and you can see kind of the JSX bit at the bottom there just kind of allows us to do this inline sort of HTML style declaration which is kind of is a bit nicer than having to do everything in plain JavaScript. See so yeah, all the components are in the components directory. There's tests in the test directory. Um, if you're wanting to learn more about writing React components and you're not too, too familiar with it, uh, we have a page in our developer documentation for how to do that. And there's also a previous dev talk, which walks you through actually writing the component, and hooking up to Redux and getting it all working properly. So next off is Redux. So Redux is a pattern and library for kind of storing data. It keeps everything very nice and clean and it has this whole concept of like a unidirectional data flow. Like the UI will display exactly what's in the store. It'll fire events in the form of actions. Um, the actions will be handled by reducers, which will do kind of pure transformations to the store uh, that are kind of nice because you can repeat them and they're easily testable and all sorts of things. Um, and then the updated state in the store will go back and be re-rendered in the UI through React. We do also have kind of selectors, which aren't a port core part of Redux, and they're mostly just kind of helper functions for accessing stored data. And they're also very helpful for computing data and doing it efficiently, so uh, that you're not kind of rerunning those computations constantly, because with, with how Redux works and connects to components, the uh, props the components could theoretically be changing anytime anything changes anywhere in the Redux store, which is a lot. Uh, so the Redux code is split between the web app and Redux repositories. So it also summon our mobile app if you're ever familiar or wanting to work on that, but it kind of it serves a similar purpose to the web app code. So basically, the Redux or the Mattermost Redux repository contains a lot of shared logic. Um, it has all the setup for the Redux stores, all the client-server communication code, and the JavaScript drivers and just a bunch of utility functions like sorting and such that we will use in both the web app and server, or sorry, web app and mobile app. Um, and then there is also some Redux code in the web app as well, as I mentioned previously. That has a lot of like view logic specific to the web app. Um, just that it's the Redux state for actually managing the components and everything that won't be used in the web or the mobile app because it has its kind of own version of that. Also has some kind of just web app specific actions which kind of compose the ones from the Redux repository to make them more convenient to use. So when writing Redux code, and you'll probably be making changes to Redux, uh, that gets a bit more complicated because it, again, it's in a separate library, so you'll have to fork that yourself. Uh, you'll be cloning it. If you clone it kind of within the Go structure next to the web app and server, uh, it makes life a lot easier because when you use the yarn run dev command or yarn run dev watch, uh, it'll be automatically able to find the web app and copy your changes into it so that you can uh, test them out actually in a proper environment. Uh, there's also an environment variable you can set if, you, if it happens to not be able to find the web app properly. Um, so yeah, if you make all your changes there, we'll, there's, a, there's some other documentation in the dev talk that'll kind of explain how to make those changes. Um, so again, I'm not going to detail them. Um, after you made those changes, you'll want to add and update unit tests it's a lot easier to write unit tests for the Redux store than it is, I think, for writing components and such in the web app. So we definitely appreciate any unit tests. And if there's anything kind of complicated, we'll usually require them for if you're submitting it back to the, or submitting a pull request back to our main repository. And then once that's approved and merged, you can go to the web app, run yarn upgrade, Pattern Redux, get your changes, and then submit your web app PR. If you're just wanting to make changes for your own purposes or wanting to actually be able to test pulling directly from the Mattermost Redux repository. You can uh, change it so the web app pulls from your fork by modifying the package.json file um, and then reinstalling the yarn dependencies. Um, and yeah, that'll work good if you're, 
again, making changes for your own purposes that won't be committed back to us. So yeah, like I said, more information is available in our developer documentation. Uh, I've, there, I've also done dev talks on Redux and Reselect, so if you want to hear more of my voice for some reason, you can go watch those. Um, there's going to also be text versions available, or there are also text versions available of those as well. Um, last but not least, unit tests, kind of very important part that we've slacked on and we're hoping to improve on greatly. So the tests in the web app are written using Jest. Uh, the, Redux, the ones in the Redux and mobile repositories are using Mocha. You're familiar with that. Um, hopefully we're going to get those unified at some point, but for now you, they're pretty similar. Um, if, if you look on the left, it's pretty straightforward. You set up the initial state. You run some sort of Redux, or you either run like Redux actions or just some functions and check the output state. It's pretty straightforward. There's also component tests, which work kind of similar, except they're using Enzyme to basically render the React components and then compare them back to some sort of, or some stored uh, snapshot that are checked into the repository. The first time you write a snapshot test, it just generates the snapshots and runs all fine. And after that, it'll kind of compare back against them to see what happens. And if stuff will change, or if you have changed, the test will fail. Uh, you, if you're wanting to update the snapshots, there's a yarn command. It'll tell you when you fail tests how to do it. It's yarn test dash u. Um, we do also have some end-to-end -end testing as well, where it renders the whole page, connects to the server, makes sure everything works right, and responds to input correctly. Those are currently in progress. There's not really many examples of them yet, um, but we're hoping to get a lot better on those in the future. So if you are submitting stuff back to uh, our repositories, we highly encourage unit tests. Um, it'll make our lives a lot easier and Heck, even if you just go back and write unit tests for existing code, we'd gladly accept those because a lot of our older stuff does not actually have it. So yeah, that's kind of a summary of how to get your development environment running and run tests and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, if you want to get further involved, you can join in on our pre-release server there. We've got a bunch of channels. We've got the developers and contributors channels are kind of the main ones we're active in, but then there's also kind of some more specific topics for uh, the channels for Redux and for mobile app and all those sorts of things if you're wanting to get help, ask questions, uh, make suggestions, or just chat, or usually mostly always on. Um, we got people kind of around the clock usually on those, so unless it's right in the middle of the night for most people, then you should be around to help. Um, definitely let us know if you run into any problems getting set up. You can file, again, breach on pre-release, you can file an issue on GitHub, etc. cetera. Uh, if, if there's something wrong in our developer setup documentation, we want to know, because obviously we're open source, we want to have people help account. Um, and anything blocking people from doing that is bad. Um, we also have a bunch of help wanted tickets on GitHub. They're in our the server repository. And yeah, if you want to take a shot at them, there's a lot available. And again, we appreciate the help. Um, you can also just build building integrations plugin are also something I very much encourage because we're very much making a push on making that easier to do and adding a lot of opportunities for rich integrations into the app as well. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, if you have any feedback on this, feel free to reach out. I'm HM Healy on GitHub, or I'm Harrison on Pre-Release Server. Um, always glad to help with questions and yeah, you know stuff like that. So yeah, see you later.